you so much, Laura, for the introduction. And welcome, everyone, to our next session. Um, as mentioned, I'm Anita Iori, and I'm a research assistant at the Berlin University of the Arts. And I will do this interview with the sound artist Jessica Ekumana, who is next to me on the left-hand side. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank to the whole Republica for organizing this session and having us here, and also for GMM, for the Gesellschaft für Musikwirtschaft und Musikkulturforschung, for having us here, and also especially for Lorenz Grünewald Schukala, who organized this whole panel with us. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Jessica to have some words that what she's doing and what about her work. Uh, as mentioned, she's a sound artist based in Berlin and as she wrote on her own website, her compositions seek a physical and cathartic effect alternating between noise and melody and playing with our perception of rhythmical structures. We will hear about that, how it is uh, a little bit later during the talk but say some other words about her. So Jessica studied uh, sound studies and generative arts at Berlin University of the Arts, so this is why actually our connection came together. And um, she's also one of the Berlin Community Radio uh, incubator residents for their 2017 edition. And her work has been presented in various institutions across Japan, Australia, and Europe. And to mention some examples, for example, she was part of CTM Club Transmediale Festival 2018. She was part of the festival and also part of the exhibition. At the exhibition, she exhibited one of her newest pieces on VR technology. And uh, at the festival part, for example, she played at Berghain, which is another circumstances than the one where we are now. Um, some other words uh, about her work, for example, her exhibition or like her work has been exhibited at uh, the Contemporary Art uh, Institute of Contemporary Art Newton, Sydney, Australia, or at Ars Electronica in Linz, or at the Electronic Music Week in Shanghai too. And today we will discuss a little bit about her work, about the technological background of her work and about her perspectives on, on the whole technological background and so on. And why I'm here, because as Laura has mentioned, I'm from the Willem Flusser archive and you will also hear why I think that Jessica's work is highly related to the media philosophers' thoughts back in the 80s um, to technology or towards technology and on this subject. So that's going to be the part of the, the talk. And after the talk, Jessica will also play about 8-10 minutes from her work. So we will introduce this whole section and about her work. And then you will hear a little bit more about uh, her work also live, sp playing live on the stage. So after this short introduction, I'm turning to Jessica with my first question, because I think it's even better if you say some words about your work, that how did you start, or how, how what was the first influential things on your work, and how did you get to this whole scene of sound art back then, and where is your work now? Maybe you can add some words to that. Uh, thanks, Anita, for the introduction first, mm -hmm. and thanks for everybody to be here. Um, I started quite late, actually. I think, um, I mean, in my teenagehood, I was already learning piano and I had a brief musical education uh, while I was living in France. And um, I think I started to get interested in electronic music at about the same time. And one composer that was, for example, really important for me is Georg Ligeti, that you must know, maybe because he's from Hungary. And um, it was really a first step for me to start thinking about sound because he wrote this really iconic uh, piano studies where it's really not about the notes anymore in a way. It's really already thinking about the sound and writing it for, um, let's say that the skills you need to have to play these uh, studies are beyond human possibilities almost sometimes. Because he worked with electronic as well and um, I think you can see how in it influenced the way he thinks about music. Um, and then I really started concretely to work with this when I arrived in Berlin. It was seven years ago or something like this. I started to work, uh, to study, sorry, at Sound Studies at the UDK. And uh, one project that I would mention maybe, it was um, a project where I did a piece for Way of syn Synthesis. Um, we presented this at CTM. It was a project coordinated by Robert Anker. 
uh, wave field synthesis in this system that you see here. I think it's about 200 loudspeakers that you have around you, and it allows you to work with sound in 3D. And I think um, there were two things that came out of this project for me. First, it allowed me to think about sounds um, in terms of space. I mean, really music, because I composed a, a piece for that. Um, and the other thing is that at that time, Robert Enke programmed an interface in a software that is called Max MSP to interface with um, this wave field synthesis system. And this is when I started for the first time to use this software that today is still at the center of my musical performances. Um, because right now, most of my musical uh, performances are with quadraphonic sounds, which means that basically you have four speakers at each corner of the room. And I especially started to work with rhythm. And uh, the idea of one of these pieces is that each, uh, speaker, in each speaker you have um, steady impulses. And uh, this never changes, but uh, the changes are about the way these impulses interact with each other, basically. Yeah, and uh, yeah, maybe I will show you quickly how Max MSP is working, because I don't know if you're familiar to this. So it looks like that. You start with a blank page, and um, it's uh, visual programming. So it works with objects that you are linking to each other, and you. Um, the f it flows in a vertical way, so from the top to the bottom. And for example, now if I want to create, I create an object like this, and let's say this part will be um, my sound card, so my audio output, and then, uh, yeah, this will be my fader for the sound. And let's say that I will go for the most simple solution, which is to create a sine wave. So this object that is called cycle is a function to create a sine wave. And to activate it, uh, it awaits some kind of information from you, which is the, the number of the frequency it should play. So now, for example, if I do this and I tell it to play 200 hertz, it Wait a second. So. Oh. Yeah. Exactly. So this is a quick introduction, but this is how this software works. Nice. And if we are talking about Max MSP now, um, do you think, and it's going to be a little bit flusserian question to you, do you think that the interface itself, so actually what you see on the screen, or as Flusser would put the technical image, uh, has an impact on your work or does it influence your work at all, what you see? Uh, yes, definitely, because as maybe you can see now already, uh, this is a kind of non-linear interfaces, because uh, if you've already worked with sound before, maybe you've done, you had the occasion to do a little bit of sound editing, and most of the time you have a timeline with your sound sample, and this is going from left to right, and um, yeah, you're just working with uh, predefined events. As here, um, you think more vertical, so in terms of sound events. And um, I think this was really influential because a lot of composition I do have a little bit of this static aspect to them. So it's more about creating a kind of static situation, but you have little changing changes in them happening slowly. So it's more of a field of sound you're going to explore. Um, I think also one of the other important aspects of using this software is the feedback I get from the interface as well, because um, the way I'm using this software is really more exploratory. I mean, most of the time I have an idea at the beginning, for example, working with rhythm, but then I don't exactly know what I'm going to end up with. And um, so I play around with some object, I see what is possible, and um, Another important point is this, is that then I'm going to make a lot of failure on, in the process or use the object in a um, non-conventional way. And I'm trying to reuse this failure as part of my practice. Um, an example that I can show you with this is um, this rhythmical piece that I'm working on. So 
this is a little bit more complicated than what I showed before, but still really simple. So you have this object that is called cycle here that I showed you before. It's uh, made for generating sine waves. And uh, I noticed that when I was sending a value of zero, then I just get to click, you know, which is normally what you don't want to hear in the sound. Um, but then I started to think that actually it's interesting. I don't really want to polish the mistakes and uh, I can reuse that to create a rhythm of its own. Yeah, so this is how this piece started. So this is actually a very creative way of using technology. And did I understand it right that you actually, you have to have a little bit of programming skills to use this software? Um, not really, because when I started, I didn't have any programming skills, mm. actually. Um, the good thing in it is that it's quite visual, so I'm actually a quite visual person. So some people prefer to work with text-based, like really dry mm. music programming, but um, I think it's actually, if you don't know so much about programming, it's a good introduction because you need to... you learn to think in terms of sending uh, messages to a function, mm. etc. And I think once you learn uh, really like uh, pure programming, then you're going to be already familiar with this way of thinking. Mm -hmm. okay. um, yeah. I was asking it because, um, again, related to Flusser's work, that uh, he mentioned in many of his texts that if you want to take over the control of the apparatus, so the machine itself, in this case the software or the computer, you have to understand what's going on inside of the machine, so inside of the apparatus, which is the black box for him. And this is why I also really think that your work is kind of related to this thought from him, because you want to really unbox, so to say, the sound or like to understand what's going on inside. And this is also highly related for Flusser uh, to freedom, to artistic freedom and experimental freedom and I also brought you a nice quote to that as he wrote in his book Into the Universe of Technical Images that the freer people become the more competent the computers to which they are connected so I think it's also a kind of your artistic freedom how you use this software and uh, to switch to another topic maybe I think it's again highly related to Flusser, and I'm so sorry that I always uh, repeat this Flusserian sense to this talk, but I think um, his so thoughts on, on the dialogue or on the playful dialogue is also again relates to your work because as he mentioned in the telematic society, or we can translate it now to the network society where we live in, we'll use um, technical equipment to communicate, uh, communicate in between people and communicate with the machine. But in the end, for him, he was really like on the human side, so to say, the communication happens in between humans. And um, I think it's also your point, because once I read in one of your interviews with another magazine that you said that for you it's super important what the people experience from your work. So when you play live, the whole experience, what they get is even more important than the, anything else, or the music itself. So maybe you can add some words about that, that why is this whole experience is super important for you. Yeah. Um, first thing uh, in this set that I'm playing right now, there's a lot of psychoacoustic effects going on. So especially uh, at one moment, the sine waves are interfering with each other in a way that you are actually hearing in your ears some tones which are not played by the speakers. Um, so the presence of the audience is important in this way that they are completing the music themselves with their body. And um, I... In this way, I also try to play with the usual concert convention um, because the sound then is not unidirectional. You're not a passive observer of uh, someone that is doing something, whatever, on the stage. Um, I don't give instructions to people before playing, but a lot of them notice that already by themselves that they can move their head, they can move somewhere else in the room, and it sounds totally different. It's a field that they are exploring themselves, and I'm also not really aware of what everybody is listening to uh, because they're going to hear something different than me. So I, I decide of the, the starting point of the situation and then it can be the experience is different from everybody. 
and um, I think I'm thinking like this because um, I started doing installation, uh, sound installations, and of course when you do installations, um, thinking about the room is really important, thinking about the context, taking the context in consideration, and uh, when you take the context in consideration, it leads you to think also about the social conditions, economical conditions, etc. that you have around you. Um, and one thing that I like also is to try to influence, let's say, group dynamics um, through sound. Yeah, so pr for example, trying to make people move around, etc. Yeah. So you mentioned something about this uh, theoretical background for your work. And I also read that uh, Gestalt theory or Gestalt psychology plays also a very important role in your work. So. I'm just asking you that maybe you can ask, add some words about that. Why Gestalt theory or why Gestalt psychology? Yeah. Uh, for the one that don't know what Gestalt theory or Gestalt psychology is, so it's the studies of the way our brain, our brain forms meaning out of uh, chaotic uh, forms. Um, so. In general, the way you form meaning is influenced by your cultural background, your expectations, and etc. So this is an example here. You have this cycle with some kind of uh, lines on them, and nothing in between. But your brain is making the link, and you can't help but see a cube. That is not here. And so this is what is happening also when I'm working with these rhythms. You have these impulses that are detached from each other but um, your brain is making the link between them and also there is some sort of mathematical relationship between them, so you, you hear polyrhythm, basically. This is another example of, um, that is important to me, it's called the phenomenon of multistability, uh, which is a phenomenon that is talked about in Gestalt theory as well. So this is the idea that you have a form that has multiple in in interpretations. Uh, so for example, if you take these vase, that is, it's an example that is quite well known, you either see two faces facing each other, or you can see a vase here. Or in this case, you can see the face of the cube here, or you can see it here. And you can, it's so complex what is happening that your brain cannot see everything at once. You're always oscillating between different interpretations. Um, yeah, and it's something that I'm working with. Super interesting. I'd like to hear even more about this background because I can see that theoretically you have a very huge background mm -hmm. on, on your work. But unfortunately, we have to move on to the performance part of the lecture. So I'm now asking you that what are we going to hear? Uh, I'm going to play the piece, the rhythmi rhythmical pieces I started to talk about earlier. Um, what you're going to hear now is going to be really different than the actual experience because I told you normally I play with four speakers and um, also with speakers that have a better sound quality. So it will be interesting to see which frequency comes across and which not. And so, and another important aspect is when I use speakers, then you have the influence of the room happening, and now you're just gonna have the dry signal in your ear. So you're more going to get the content and not really the experience, the full experience. But let's see. Yeah. Thank you so much. We are <laughs> looking you. forward to it. Thank you.
maybe any questions from the audience? If not, then thank you so much. And also, Jessica, thank you so much for this piece. We would like to listen to it, I think, hours long, but we had only a few minutes. Thanks a lot for being here and have a nice day.